beautiful day. It is an amazing reason to stand up on our feet, to give God some praise on today. Sometimes we may not always feel like it in our body, but listen, let me encourage you in those moments to challenge your body, to, to, to command your body. We're going to bless him today. Regardless of what week we had, we are going to bless the Lord. We are going to join in with creation, and we are going to sing forth his praise on today. Hallelujah. Come on, you can put your hands together like this. You at home, you can do the same thing. Come on, make that sound in this place. God, you are worthy, you are deserving. And that's why we bless you. This song says this. Bless the Lord, oh my ones. Bless the Lord. the Lord, are you his angels, and let all the earth sing forth his praises, come on, that's you and me, here we go, come on, come on and bless him, come on and praise his name, come on, come on and bless him, this is your invitation, hey, come on, come on and bless him, come on and praise his name, come on, come on and bless him, will you sing that with us, here we go. Because he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we pray. 
on, can you say that? Let me hear you say. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. I can't hear you. Let me hear it. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. It may not even be for you. It may be the person come standing on, next on, to you that you bless him for. Come on and praise God, we praise your name. Come on, come on, because somebody in here needs you today. So we say, come on, come on. Somebody in here needs their heart lifted. Someone in here needs your comfort, God. Someone in here needs your joy, God. Someone in here needs your peace, God. Come on, come on, come on. Let me hear you say, come on, come on and listen. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and listen. Everybody say, come on, come on. just blessing him and letting him know making his name great boasting on our father and let him know how much we appreciate him and how good he has been we just want to welcome you if this is your first time with us hey y'all hey <laughs> we are so glad that you chose to be here this Sunday with us whether it's your first time here in the building or it's your first time joining us online you are welcome here 
We want you to know that you are more than a visitor, more than a first time, first timer, first time comer. You are family. You are a part of a community and we want to connect with you. So if this is your first time, we want to connect with you in the back at our connect corner. We just want to know who you are. We want to be able to follow through and, and follow you along this journey that you have began this Sunday. So if you can fill out a connect card so that we can know who you are, know your family, know what you love, and we also want to be able to pray with you. If you came here and this has been a hard week, this has been a hard season, if you meet us at the Connect Corner, we want to pray with you as well. Fill out a Connect card and, uh, and, and just connect with us. We even have something to put in your hand. You know, you can hug us, you can fist bump, and you can get one of those amazing, I think it's a, a mug or a Bible, whatever it is, it's nice. Okay? It's nice. But we're going to continue worshiping because God is good. It was a little cloudy outside when she was talking. It was a, raining a little bit, but the sun came out. <laughs> and in your life, you may be in a, a season like that, but the sun will come out. And there is always going to be a reason to give him praise, to give him glory. One, two, ten thousand reasons. We bless him. Everybody say, yeah. yeah. Ten thousand reasons to give him glory. Hey, if you agree, say, yeah. yeah. It's a new day dawn, and it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, God, let me be singing.
our worship and our praise rise, God. May it come from our hearts. May it bless you. May you be pleased with what you hear. Yeah. 
this for you, God, for you to be glorified in my life, for you to be lifted high. All I want is for was on the uh, side over here in this just moment, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, Lord, I feel it in my heart to encourage everybody. I don't want to interrupt the moment. And then I remembered I'm supposed to come up here and encourage everybody. That was in the plan. I enter into a time like this the same way you do. We are all processing many feelings, emotions, perspectives, the events of the past few weeks in our personal lives, in our national life, globally. And we carry all that into this moment. And this is what I, this is what I feel sometimes. I feel like the weight of this, um, let me confess to you, I feel the weight of this cynicism that sneaks into our worship sometimes. And it's the kind of thing that causes us not to deny God, but to believe less of Him. It's the kind of thing that causes us not to, you know, not come to church, but just to not engage because we feel perhaps like it's too much, it seems like a too much of a stretch. And literally as I'm thinking, I forgot that I'm supposed to come up here and talk to you and these things are going through my head and now I'm just gonna dump them out here for a second. Uh, there's this book title in the book that I read many years ago that I don't remember even so much about the book except the title because I loved it so much. It said, hard times require furious dancing. And there is just this idea that, for me, I don't ever want to be like the ones who shrink back. Okay, and I'm going to just get, get Bible on you here for a second. Shrink back and are destroyed, right? That's what it says in the book of Revelation. But the ones who, are, who believe and are saved. And I want to just caution us. That's what my word is today. I want to caution us against the cynicism of the age. I understand it. It's not that I'm not empathetic toward it. I feel it myself. But if I believe what we're singing about today, that's what I'm saying. If I believe what we're singing about, that God indeed has been good, that I have 10,000 reasons and then more to be able to give thanks to him, then even what you and I have witnessed and experienced in our present day, even what we've walked through personally, is not enough to, to, to crush the hope that we have. It's not enough to, to silence our praise. It's not enough. So it's almost like the people of God are standing in this place between heaven and earth saying, hey, you could throw your worst at me, hell, and, and still we will give praise. Because we know that in the end, our God is victorious. And we know that in the end, our God deserves praise. And we've already got enough to give him praise for and we're already anticipating the fulfillment of every good promise in our lives that says, okay, my mouth won't be shut. And I will not give in to this cynicism. Because I already know I can praise him. I don't know why I'm feeling emotional right now, but I'll tell you what, it's because I've been my, and I was going to make these comments at the beginning of my sermon, but it's because my heart, like yours, 
Every day, I, I watch what's happened. What's happened in our country in Buffalo and Uvalde, and 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 you know, in I mean, just moment after moment. And you're like, how much more can we absorb? And the disagreements, and the, I, I mean, all of it. Well-meaning people who just are so confused. And I'm like, in the midst of this, I think God's people. Our first reflex needs to be repentance, prayer, and praise. Repentance, prayer, and hope. Repentance, prayer. We need to do that, you guys. So this is what we're going to do right now. First of all, we're going to say, Lord, I repent of a cynical attitude. I will not believe less of you because things are difficult right now. I will not stop looking to you and praying because it seems like things are confusing or even insurmountable right now. I won't do that. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to lead you in a moment here. I want you to, to create a space right where you are. Some of you guys might want to close your eyes just so you can have a moment with God. And I want to encourage you to take a second and check your heart and say, Lord, if I have believed less of you, if I have shrunk back, I repent of that, God, because that's not my call. I know too much about you. You have told me too much about yourself, and I've seen too much about you, Lord, for me to shrink back. And so, Lord, I repent of that. I turn away from it. I reject it as not of you. I'm going to send it back from where it came from. I'm going to send it back to the depths from where it came. And then I want to take a second, and I want to, as God's people say, Lord, we... We bring our hearts before you in surrender and ask for mercy. There are people gathered among us here today who've experienced loss, grief, hardship, who are in the midst of depression. And Lord, we first just believe for you to, to inhabit the praises of this moment, that in their, in their hearts they would sense who you are, God, see who you are. And God, that you do a work of healing encouragement. Lord, that you'd meet every need in this house today. And those who are watching, connecting in other places, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'd start with that. But then, Lord, we bring ourselves before you today and pray for the needs of our nation as well, God. We don't even know the answers, Lord. And the smartest people, all the best and the brightest, are in disagreement about what the answers are. But, Lord, we know, God, you are our hope. Not, not all those other things, Lord. So would you give wisdom to those in leadership? Would you give wisdom to those who are the shot callers in these moments, Lord? Would you give mercy to our nation? We pray. And, Lord, please be near to those who are hurting and grieving, Lord, at this moment. God, we need you. We need you as a nation. We need you as a city. We need you as families and as a church. We need you today, God. We need you. Would you just, would you just now, this is just my next step, would you just lift your hands to him today and say, God, I need you. And just like a child would reach for their, 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 their father today, would you just lift your hands up to him and say, I need you, Father. We need you today. We need you to glorify your name in this moment. We need you to show yourself strong. We need our nation, our city, our, our, our community, Lord, our family, our church. We need to be turned toward you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would remove the pride, remove the cynicism, remove the unbelief. God, that you would, by your grace and mercy, turn us towards you today, God. need in this moment, not small prayers. Bold faith. God honors it. God honors bold faith because bold faith honors God. That's the reason. So Lord, that's what we want in this place, in this house. We pray that you continue to fill our hearts. All I want is for you, you to be glorified. You to be lifted high. All I want is for you. You to be glorified. You to be glorified. Sing it again. All I want. All I want is for you to be glorified.
today that God hears our prayers, that God has called us as a people to stand in intercession. We're going to pray. I'm just telling you this. There's, I'm gonna, we're going to pray on June 29th together as a church. It's a Wednesday night. It's going to be the first of a summer, some summer prayer gatherings. And hopefully, as God grants it, makes it possible, we'll just keep doing that to have prayer gatherings together. But this is the thing. I want to call some of you guys to be people who will, don't be cynical today. When you, when you feel that in your heart, when you feel that thing to believe less of people, to look with suspicion upon, just say, Lord, that's not what you called me to do. I just don't believe it's in our, it's in our DNA. I don't ever see Jesus acting like that. And I want, to, I want to follow his example. That's just the bottom line. I am so grateful that when we gather like this, I want to say this. We have teams who work super hard to set the table for us to worship together. And can we just say thank you to our worship team, production team, load in, load out. I just, I feel it in my heart just to encourage them, to say we appreciate them. They don't do it so that you'll say thanks to them, but, but it, it really does matter. We love you guys. We love everybody who's a part of this and making things happen here at this church. And, uh, and man, so grateful for what God is doing here and in every other church in our area where the gospel's preached, amen? This is ultimately about Jesus. We're not playing for the name on, on the back of the jersey, right? That's my own name. We're, we're playing for the name on the front of the jersey. That's, that's kingdom of God. That's Jesus. So that's what we're doing, all right? So we praise the Lord today. Turn to somebody near you before you're seated and say, man, I, I'm so glad I get to worship next to you today. Welcome to church this morning. Every Sunday at New City, you can expect a powerful time of worship, a message from God's Word, and an invitation to take steps toward experiencing new life, a new way, and a new purpose through Jesus. If you're joining us for the first time, we would love to get to know you. Don't forget to stop by the Connect Corner in the lobby after the service. And if you're joining us online, you can connect with any of our online hosts. Our team would love to give you a special gift, answer any questions you have, and introduce you to the people and purpose of New City Church. Summer is officially here, and we are looking forward to all the fun summer events we will be doing together as a church. Our first exciting opportunity to serve as a church is this week. We are partnering with Michelle Clark High School and Gonzalez Scholastic Academy to host end of the year celebrations for their students, their faculty and their families. Convoy of Hope is bringing an entire semi truck to be a part of these exciting events. You can serve and be a part of this outreach in a couple of different ways. You can help sort and prep supplies in advance at Oak Brook Community Church on Thursday, June 9th, or you can help host the celebrations on June 10th or 11th at the schools. You pick the day and the way you'd like to serve. For more information, go to newcity.life. 
Next Sunday kicks off a whole summer long series at New City Youth. Pastor Steve will be speaking and you can look forward to fun games, classy snacks, worship and making some new friends. We'll meet at 7 p.m. right here on the campus of North Central College. It's going to be a blast and we can't wait to see you there. Are you looking to build friendships and grow in your faith here at New City? Step one is coming up on Sunday, June 26th, right after our 10 a.m. service. Step one is a personal interactive session where you can meet our team, explore ways to get involved and find your feet here at New City. Whether you're new to our church or just looking for the right place to fit in, step one is for you. Childcare and lunch is on us, so all you need to do is show up. Register today at newcity.life. Prayer is the difference between the best that we can do and the best that God can do. On Wednesday, June 29th, we will be gathering for prayer as a church here on the campus of North Central College. This is the first of our monthly prayer gatherings this summer, and we want you to be there to pray for our church, our families, and our world. Remember, anyone can pray. Whatever you are walking through today, God is faithful to meet your needs. Let's open our hearts to hear from Him now. We love you, New City, and we are so glad you're here. Have a great Sunday. Well, good morning, New City. Hey, coming up right now is the class of 2022. Can you give it up for them? It's a, this is a big deal. I just feel like I need to get out of the way. We, uh, we, uh, we ask each of them to share uh, just about 60 seconds. Just kidding. They were like, what? Did you guys get asked? Um, but we wanted to honor you guys today. This is, again, this is a big deal. So we wanted to honor and celebrate you today. And we wanted you guys to know that we're all here to pray for you and be with you in this next season. It says this in Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. So where God guides, he provides. Come on. We're going to say that again. Where God guides, he provides. Can you guys say he guides and he provides? Love it. So in this next season, wherever the Lord has you, he is with you. It says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Un acknowledge the Lord. That means invite him into your decisions and he will make your path straight. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go one by one and I'm just going to, I'm going to say some of their accomplishments and what's next in this season. And so first up, we have a uh, I was like, your mom's going to kill you. Take the jacket off. <laughs> this is uh, Ishmael, who won the Fisher Award at Fisher Middle School, everybody. That's a big deal. But he graduated from Fisher, and he's taken his talents to Wabonzi Valley High School, home of the Warriors, everybody. Home of the Warriors. Next up, we have Jackson. Jackson is just graduated from Wheaton Christian Grammar School, and he's going to Wheaton Academy, which is literally in his front yard. So he's excited about that. Erica has a special place in my heart because you're the youngest. Raise your hand if you're, if you're the youngest in the, in the building. They save the best for last, Erica. But Erica just graduated from Aurora Christian, and she'll now be going to Aurora Christian. This is Kylea. She graduated from Aurora Christian as well and will attend Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids. Home of the Lakers, everybody. I don't know if you knew that. That's Google. This is, oh, sorry, Bryce Peak, everybody. Bryce, can you wave your hand? He was, like, he was like, Mom, I do not want to go up there. Bryce is graduating from, just graduated from Downer South, and we pl will be playing lacrosse at Carthage College. Well, we're all come to your games, Bryce. This is, uh, this is Rebecca D'Souza. You guys could have clapped while I was changing cards. But this is Rebecca and she just graduated from Neuqua Valley and will be studying all the way at North Central College. And so uh, if we ever need something, Rebecca's great, but congratulations, Rebecca. 
This is Jory, everybody. You might not know this about Jory. Every, you know what? Everybody up here has served in some capacity at New City Church, and we're so thankful for that. But Jory operates the camera, so during, during COVID times, peak COVID times, Jory's on the camera going like this. But Jory just gra graduated from Wheaton Academy, or today's graduation. She didn't graduate yet, but she graduated from New City Church today, everybody. And she is going, she'll be going to Wheaton College in the fall. <laughs> Jake Farley, everybody. look at this smile on Jake Farley, everybody. Jake just graduated from right here at North Central College with a degree in finance. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> Kay Hammond, everybody. Kay, can you wave your hand? Kay just graduated from Wheaton College um, with a degree in biology. Congrats, Kay. We also, we also have Karina Hammond, everybody. Karina, can you wave your hand? She just graduated from North Central College and a degree in being a, just a great person. This is, uh, this is Alex Smith. Alec graduated from Southern New Hampshire University with a degree in Bachelor's in Information Technology, which I just learned is IT, everybody. That's a degree in IT. Congrats, Alec. This is, uh, this is Thomas Yarbrough, graduated from Elmhurst University with a degree in exercise science and biology. And as Thomas would say, it's a great day to be a J. Go Elmhurst. This is Michael Georgopoulos, graduated from Southeastern University with a degree in business management. Give it up for Michael. And that's his mom. But uh, let's give it up for the class of 2022 one last time, everybody. We're proud of you. You did it. Um, you guys are going to get cards on your way out. It's free college. We paid for everything. Just kidding. It is a small gift for you guys, but you guys can head off the stage. We love you. New City Church, please know this. This is, they're next. They got next. And so I believe and hopefully you believe that the future here at New City Church is bright. Yes. It was very underwhelming, right? <laughs> it was so exciting. And then there's just this one guy now. You uh, have received, I think, that uh, we are handing these out, these kids' kits for the summer. We'll be talking about the armor of God and our kids' ministry, New City Kids, all summer long. Uh, there's got some great stuff. Each of those kits comes with seven different things for the weekly thi uh, weekly subject. There's a little guy in here uh, that you can participate with, work with your kids on, uh, and put the armor on that guy. Uh, so it's pretty cool stuff for you to be able to engage and be a part of that discipleship process and partner with us as we go through our summertime in New City Kids. Listen, um, we went through pandemic. We had lots of moments where we were trying to go, you know, have church, be at church with with our little ones, which is a blessing. I love that my kids love coming to church. Um, but let me just say, I am so grateful for kids workers who are willing to, to take on the discipling of these kids on a Sunday morning. So let's give it up for all those who are helping Esther, Ashley, those who have led uh, as a part of New City Kids. And listen, I know some of you guys are asking me today, how, how do I become a part of this kids team? Um, how can I serve in kids' ministry? I can see it on your faces that there are many of you who are longing. And, and so I'm going to say, listen, you can, you can sign up. You could talk to us at the Connect Corner. You can sign up. We do need help in kids' ministry because, man, there are some Sundays where we are busting at the seams. We've got lots of kids there. And we don't look at this as child care. We look at this as discipleship. And so this is a way for you to uh, leave a legacy in a small way to minister and love on and, and help teach these kids uh, what it means that they are loved by God, they are made by God and for God. So let's, uh, let's just really be grateful for our kids workers today. 
Next Sunday, as it was mentioned, then we're going to be uh, kicking off a summer series, more or less weekly, without the holiday weekends in there. Um, we're going to be having uh, a weekly meetings with New City Youth. It is uh, a great time, and uh, I'll be kicking it off, but then everybody, there's some great speakers scheduled for the, for the summer, great worship, all that stuff. Um, today, we are going to be talking from our series, We Are, um, and we're going to be talking about why do we say... When we talk about who we are, why do we say that generosity is our privilege? Normally, I will say this at the beginning of a talk like this, at the beginning of a message, I will say, don't worry, I'm going to talk about money, but at the end of service, I'm not going to be taking an offering or anything like that. That's what I say. And it's like a way of people like, oh, goodness, because they're like, if I'd have known that you were going to talk about money today, I probably wouldn't have come or I you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have brought my, you know, dang, my phone can do everything now. Shoot. You know, uh, it used to be like, I don't have my checkbook. But now I'm like, you sure do. <laughs> you got it. Normally I say, don't worry. But uh, today I'm going to say, at the end, I am going to ask you to respond. I am going to ask you to respond in faith. And so just keep that in mind. If you want to put your defenses up now, you can. Um, but let's all stand together. I have a text. Uh, the scripture is rich with teaching on this. And though, uh, I just thought, I thought of it as I was preparing this week. I was like, man, I'm talking about, in, in, my, in my sermon, it just seems like I've, I've got like a focus today on two things that we love to talk about, but we don't love to do. We love to talk about prayer, and we love to talk about giving, but we don't always love to do them, or at least we're not so great at them. It's a challenge to do it. Let me just start with that today, that I know that this is the case for all of us. But by God's grace, He's going to help us to grow up to be the people that we are supposed to be. And as I mentioned, at the end of this month, we've got our first Wednesday prayer meeting that I want to encourage you to be at. If it's possible for you to be a part of that moment uh, with your schedule, we're going to be right here on the campus of North Central College, not in this room, but just two blocks, maybe three blocks down the road um, at, uh, at a location that I won't even buy, Heininger Hall. Like, you guys are never going to remember that, so just look it up online. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is writing to a group of believers who, are, who have been generous. And he says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. God will generously provide all you need and then you'll have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they who share freely and give generously to the poor, their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, God will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Let me read that again. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so you can always be generous. I feel like I should say it again. Not, not like I was coming into this thinking I'm going to read this three times, but let me just give it to you again. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Lord, I pray that you would help our hearts to receive your word today and to respond to it in obedience and faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. For anyone curious, the largest known personal check ever written, according to the internet, was $974,790,375. Dollars and 77 cents. They didn't even want to round up. I'll tell you why. It was written by a guy named Harold Hamm to pay his ex wife a court mandated divorce settlement. And he said, I won't even round up. I don't, that's not a real quote. <laughs> but I'm imagining it in my head. She originally refused to cash the check, feeling that the amount was too small, given, even though it was close to a billion dollars, his net worth was 18 billion, and so she was feeling like maybe she didn't get what she was deserving, but in the next, apparently the next day, she decided to cash it anyway, 
thinking, why not? It's a billion dollars. According to Forbes magazine, the process of cashing the check went almost like every other check cashing, except that the bank called Ham to make sure that the check was legit. Excuse me, sir, we have a check for $970 million here. Just making sure you're good with that. Doesn't sound like anybody was happy in this situation. And while I can kind of make light of this, it's not something that is, you know, foreign to most of us. Uh, in these kind of contentious situations, nobody ends up happy, right? Most people don't like to part with money at all. But when we look at the scriptures, and maybe even I, I might say perhaps when, then when we look at the scriptures, that's why money is talked about so often, right? And I, I had a revelation as a young minister, as a young preacher, um, that, that it just took me a while to understand this, maybe a little bit, a few more times around the sun in, in my life to realize that the reason this is, is be, the reason that money is so close to our hearts is because money represents to us. It's what we've gotten in exchange for our time, for our gifts, for our efforts, right? We've sacrificed usually quite a bit to get whatever we have. And so at, when people ask us to part with it, you know, it's, it's hard to do that. And so I understand that. But it's important then that we talk today about why it matters as a church that we say generosity is our privilege, Okay, that's something we say. And I'm gonna, I, thankfully, you guys said we had all these prelims. We had a wonderful time of worship. We did the graduate thing. And now I don't have a lot of time. So the pain won't last long. But I believe that this is important. I got five points to give to you today. Really quick, write them down because I want you to come back to this and look at it. So feel free to take open your phone and, and, and jot these notes down. Or if you're old school and you have a pen, that's isn't it funny when you're like, ask people now, do you have a pen? No, people are like, nope. Nope, I don't have it. But if you like to write things down, write this down. Number one, generosity is God's idea. Our text says God gives seed to the sower. And all throughout our text, Paul is talking about a God who gives and who gives and who gives. And this is what I love to say. God loves to give and he's very good at it. He's so good at it. You go back to the beginning of the Bible and you see the creative generosity of God or you could say the generous creativity of God expressed in all the ways that he blesses humankind that we can see. Everything the Bible says that you and I have that is good is given to us by God. It's difficult for some people to truly accept this. They say, I, I don't know about that. I went, I, you know, I, I went, I had nothing. And I went to school, right? And then I, I or I, I built this business. I hustled day, night. I worked so hard. I, I went out and I got that bread. Don't tell me that, that this was something that was given to me at all. But let me just ask you this, really. I, I, I respect that if you had to hustle for whatever you have. But who gave you the hustle? <laughs> Who gave you the intellect, the creativity, the energy to make all of that happen? Every good thing in our lives comes from our Father, who blesses, the Bible says, both the righteous and the wicked. So be careful. I find that this is really, side note, I can't go on too many rabbit trails in this sermon, but this is a side note. A lot of times when we have money, we think it's because we're good, but just good check in our hearts to remember that God blesses both the righteous and the wicked. He sends the rain to fall and the sun to shine on both of them all. So don't you worry. Don't just start thinking just because you got what you need that it's because you deserved it. God just loves to give. Larry Fink, the founder of BlackRock Financials, was asked, I heard the podcast, how much he would pay. It was the inter most interesting podcast question I've ever heard. Um, wh what, would he, what would he pay? His net worth is, is, I mean, at the time, I think it was over a billion dollars. It's probably who knows how much more now. Um, what would you pay for another year of life? What would you give of your net worth for another year of life? And his answer, I guess somewhat predictably, although you might wonder what he said, his answer was, I would give it all. For one more year. I would start from scratch with nothing. And for those of you who have faced this in reality, for those of you who have faced it with loved ones, you would say, I would give it all. Everything that I have, I would give it all. Because that, just to have what I can't give to myself, God is the author of life. 
So I want to I want to flip that thought on its head and I want to tell you today when you woke up today you got gift uh, you got a gift of breath in your lungs and that gift of breath in your lungs is a billion dollar gift. In case you came to church today thinking I don't know what God has done I don't know what what do I have to give you got a billion dollar gift this morning when you looked out the window you got a billion dollar view on your way to church you got a billion dollar day today to live I believe so do you live with a breath to breath gratitude for the gifts that God has given you Jesus talked about money so much he said if you want to Find your heart. I'll give you the map. He said, just, just look where your money, look where your treasure is going. Because that's where you're going to find. That's where, follow that money. Every time, I, I just want you to see that every time Jesus said, just, this is where you're going to be able to locate your heart. Just look at where your money is. So start there. Know that God has given you every good gift that you've got in your life. And generosity is God's idea. But then I had this revelation I think it was maybe two or three years ago, so I'm well into my adult life. Uh, you know, by this time, I've read the Bible through and read, this parable, read these parables so many times. And as I was studying all the different parables that Jesus, where Jesus talks about money, I realized that in every one of them, nearly every one of them, Jesus is talking about the, the characters are managing somebody else's money. <laughs> They're all money managers. Every time. And so here's point number two, how we need to look at what God has given to us. We are managers, not owners. So every good thing that we have, all that we have, the billion-dollar gift of breath, and then whatever resources we have, those are all given to us by the gracious hand of God. In part, but we are managers, not owners. So I want to ask today, because not many people do anymore. I wouldn't be surprised if it's just a handful of people. How many people here have cash on you today? Oh, I'm impressed. You guys are ready for the end of the world, right? You're like, I've got, to go I've got a go bag with me all the time. So, Thomas, you raise your hand. How much, how much cash do you have on you? See, he's got 60 bucks on him today. He's a graduate. That's why he's, 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 he's <laughs> that money, that money needs to go to pay down that, that uh, loan, right? So here's what I want you to do, Thomas. Thomas, uh, who would, who would like, I, I, got, I got this, my guy Kiva right here. It's my friend Kiva right here. Thomas, you know Kiva, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you guys are tight, that's right. Give that 60 bucks to Kiva. You just, just, just give it to him. Kiva, have a great Sunday, brother. <laughs> Take that girl out to lunch and enjoy yourselves. Give it up, Kiva and Karina. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Now, I, for real, you keep that money. Okay, Thomas? Is it good with you? Okay, it's good with him. He said it's good with him. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you why it's even good with him. Because I gave him the 60 bucks before service. <laughs> it's my 60 bucks. <laughs> and now it's Kiva's 60 bucks. But here's the thing. It's so much easier for Thomas to give that 60 bucks away because he knows that I gave it to him. <laughs> right? He knew that his job today was to hold on to that 60 bucks until I told him what to do with it. That's what I said. And so this is what I want you to see. His job was to manage that until I told him what to do with it. We are created from the beginning in Genesis all the way through, all the way through the scriptures, from the parables that Jesus teaches and beyond. What Paul is saying in our text today, we were created to hold something in trust for someone else. And to cultivate it, to flourishing. We're wired. Guys, I want you to see this. It's okay. We're wired to feel a satisfaction in management, in, in managing, in stewarding those resources. But here's what happens. Sin makes us obsessed with ownership. It's okay. It's great to be satisfied in stewarding well what God has given to you. I actually believe it's part of the key. God will bless you with more if you steward it well. But where sin twists this thing is he makes us obsessed with holding tightly to it and feeling like we own it. If I realize that every good thing in my life has come to me from the, the wise and generous hand of God, and he's only asking me to hold on to it and to care for it, then I can hold it loose, loosely 
and purposefully. See, the generous hand of God has entrusted to you and to me all the resources and the good things that in his wisdom he determined that we should manage. So don't forget, we are managers, not owners. Number three, generosity is a decision. We say generosity is our privilege, but before we get to that, generosity is a decision. Paul says that God gives seed to the sower. And I, I've never been able to, in my own life, keep a plant alive. I really, uh, you know, not good at this. I've never been working on a farm or anything else. But the, the rudimentary knowledge I have of growing things is this. Seed has to be sown for it to grow. <laughs> It was a, a, a while ago, a couple years ago, I overheard this, but it was, uh, I'm not exaggerating this conversation that I overheard in Starbucks. Two young adults, maybe some graduates like the ones we have in here in the house today, and the, the one was saying to the other, I would, I would like to own a business. I mean, they're talking about their future. And I, they were right next to me talking kind of loud, and they were like, I, I would like to own a business, but I'm, I just, I don't want it to be risky. And I, I also don't want it to be stressful, um, but I'd like it to be lucrative. <laughs> Not, no exaggeration. They went through this thing. And, and I, I just had to chuckle there because ask any business owner, it's definitely going to be risky. It's definitely going to be stressful. And if you're really lucky, it might be lucrative, right? That, that, that's, that's just the way it is. We're like, I would like to have this without any cost. We're a me-centered society, but we are just me-centered by nature sometimes, right? We love to focus on me. I got to get me some me time. I got to take care of me. But the me-first mentality doesn't always work. You cannot be a me-first mother. No, right now our littlest one is waking up again and getting, getting close to that nine-month sleep regression and waking up through the night. Jesse's having to get up and go, you know, make sure that he's good and comfort him and all that stuff. And listen, that's not, that's not easy for mother. You know, you could say, oh, I, I want, I would love to have a, we would love to have a child. We just, but we don't want any sleepless nights. <laughs> it's not going to happen probably. There's going to be some sleepless nights. You can't be a me first, you can't be a me first husband. It doesn't work that way. You know, you, you, can't, you can't really say, well, this is all about me. It does, a healthy marriage works because two people are all the time preferring the other person. <laughs> That's the healthiest marriage is when you just go into it, as the way I say, is it's not a 50-50 compromise situation. Not that compromise isn't necessary, but the situation is this. It's 100-100 give-give all the time. Feels like sac if a, good, a good marriage feels like sacrifice all the time. <laughs> but the love and the stability that come from that, they're worth it. You, you have never, I've never heard, you cannot have harvest without sacrifice. You have to sow seed in order to reap results. So here's my encouragement to you today. Do not practice me first living with leftover giving. It's a cornerstone discipline for some of you, and I'm going to challenge you today as we, as we literally are just reaching the end of this. Give first and give generously. Pick a percentage of your income and give it away first. The Bible is clear throughout that the first 10% of our income belongs to God and should be sown as a seed of acknowledgement that God is our source. As you argue with me internally right now, about giving more to church, <laughs> let, me ask you some, let me ask you to ask yourself some questions. Try to identify why am I arguing right now? Why do I want him to shut up? <laughs> Try to identify what's at the center of that resistance or that reluctance to give and, I, and, and, and deal with that in light of what the scripture has to say. Deal with that in light of your relationship with God. And, and some of you guys, I would even encourage you. I know this is, I, I mean, I'm not, all of, the, all of those reasons are and those, that process that we go through is great for growing up. But some of you, I would just have this very simple piece of advice when you're wrestling with all this stuff. Give it anyway. And watch what happens in your heart. You'll find that it's not usually about the money or the dollars that you give. It's usually about the heart. Psalm 126 says, those who sow with tears 
will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Let me help you see this. Sometimes the sowing makes us weepy. But the harvest is worth it. Our culture has become so pain-averse, so sacrifice-averse, so discomfort-averse, <laughs> that we've been led to believe that anything that causes me discomfort or requires something difficult of me is, is, is not okay. And, and so but my question is, how will we ever reap what we need to reap in marriages, in families, in churches, in communities, in, in cities, if we're unwilling to sow first, even in tears? Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost was a feast day, right, in Jerusalem, and it marked the start of the harvest season. It was a harvest feast. And so those of you who might know the Bible a little bit know that at this time people were gathered in Jerusalem from all parts to celebrate this feast together. And it's at this moment that the Holy Spirit is poured out on those followers of Jesus who were waiting in obedience as Jesus had told them to do. And Peter, the guy who was a coward at the cross, stands up and boldly preaches, calls people to repentance to put their hope and their trust in a resurrected Jesus. And a harvest of souls happens on that day. But here's what I want you to see. You don't get Pentecost revival without Passover pain. See, before there was ever this harvest, there was the garden agony of Jesus. There was the abuse and the torture that he experienced. There was the pain of crucifixion and his death and his, and his willful submission to the will of the Father. And that's what brought about the Pentecost harvest. God has given you seed, Paul says. He blesses you, and he wants to bless you with a harvest as well. But it's your decision to sow. There's no way for me to be fruitful without forfeiting something. Could it be possible that this in our lives, and really as God's people, and I'm not just talking about money alone here right now, but could it be possible that God wants to bring about a new season of fruitfulness in your life, but it requires first a season of sacrifice. It's a decision. Number four, generosity outlives me. Your life is limited. And I'll have to skip some things here to get to just my clothes, but this is the thing. Our, our preoccupation with fame, our preoccupation with wealth sometimes is because we want to feel like we are unlimited. Wouldn't it be awesome if I could just buy whatever I wanted? Wouldn't it be awesome if I could afford the best, the very best, if I could build a giant monument, this building, and put my name on it, and, and, and then everybody will remember? I want to live forever, right? We're obsessed with it. Our obsession with youth is rooted in that hope of everlasting life. But the problem is, having been twisted by sin, it leads to greed and to vanity and to anxiety and all kinds of other stuff because we haven't settled into the reality that I am limited. I can't live forever, have everything. My time, my stuff, my life is limited. And so sometimes in, out of anxiety and reaction to this, we spend our day, we spend our time, you know, counting, counting days and dollars. Remember that moment when Abraham is sitting in his tent, he's left everything behind, and he's complaining to God saying, I know you told me that I was going to be a father, but that was like years ago, like 13 years ago. And God says, Abraham, step out of the tent and look up. And he says, what do you see? See those stars? He says, your descendants are going to be more than those stars. I'll make you not just a father, but a, a, a father of many, a father of a great nation. And your generations are going to multiply beyond your counting. And the whole earth, he says, will be blessed through you. So I want you to see this. Abraham is sitting in his tent thinking about his days and his dollars. And God says, no, I'm thinking about nations and generations. Old Abe wants a family. God wants to redeem the whole world. 
How much time do we spend worrying about our resources? Is it possible that God has a better plan for them than we do? And if we were obedient to him and did our, our level best to follow his way, that he would use us to be a blessing beyond our imagination. Money is a means in life, but it isn't the meaning of life. It doesn't get much time at funerals. Today we remember so-and-so whose net worth, they never say that, do they? What do you want to be celebrated for at the end of your life, at the end of your limited days? What do you want to be thanked for at the end of your life, of your limited days? If you don't answer that now, if you don't determine where you want your resources to go to make an impact, then let me just tell you, I will say this, and this is the best line that some of you guys have heard. I've said it before, but you just need to write it down and ponder it. If you do not decide where you want your resources to make an impact, then it will be your appetites that eat all of those things up. The true meaning of life, Nelson Henderson said, is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. So let me say it another way, point number five and to close. You are blessed to be a blessing. That's what our text says. Paul says God will richly, he'll always take care of you. He'll always give you what you need so that you can always be generous to others. Are we always generous? I mean, I didn't even... I did not even in my sermon, I, but when I read our text today, those notes, those, those words jumped out at me. God will always do it so that you can always do it. Are you always generous? I want to always be generous. With my, with my money, I want to always be generous. With my words, I want to always be generous to others and, 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 and believe the best. I want to always, it's part of that cynicism. I don't want to shrink into this small man, Right? I want to be magnanimous and generous. I want to be able to believe the best. I want to be the person that, is, that believes that God is blessing me always so that I can be a blessing. God shows me mercy so that I can show mercy. God gives me wisdom so that I can give wisdom. God gives me resources so that I can bless others. I want that to be my epithet. Legacy is a life that outlives me. And I want you to know today, every action as believers for you and I is not just this, this uh, just, just, you know, proximate action. It's not just this very limited thing. It's larger than what we're doing. Every action that we have has a ripple effect that outlives and outlasts us when we're doing it for the kingdom of God. It's a part of a grander plan that our Heavenly Father is working through us. And so when you sign up to be a Christ follower, you have no idea what God intends to do through your obedient life. Your faithful, faith-filled life is going to impact others. Like we say all the time here, your right now resources can make a forever difference. So whatever God has placed in my hand is actually meant to be deployed for eternal objectives. And that could be so that I can disciple my children and raise them up and give them a life so that they can be sent out into the world, resourced well to be disciples and followers of Jesus. I'm not saying give it all away, don't take care of your family. That's actually your first responsibility. So don't get me wrong here. That's not what I'm saying. But God is able to bless you at all times, at all times and in every way so that you might be generous always to others. If it's influence, let it be deployed for the kingdom of God. If it's resources, let them be deployed for the kingdom of God. If it's opportunities, let them be maximized for the kingdom of God. Man. In John 12, I'm closing with this. Andrew and Philip, these two disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus... Some of you guys, this is one of these moments in the Bible where I know, I'm, I'm sure many of us when we're reading this passage, we're kind of like, we're like confused by it. They say to Jesus, there are some Greeks, there are some Gentiles at the door who want to see you. And Jesus is, you can imagine his whole demeanor changes at this moment. And he says this, the hour, this is the next words in the text. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And Andrew and Philip are like, so should we have them wait or ask them to come back later? <laughs> it seems like a non sequitur, right? It seems like why, why Jesus looks off and it isn't the hour has come. Why does Jesus take this, the Gentiles at his door to mean that the hour has come? 
to Jesus, it was the sign that his ministry, which had been limited to, 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 to Jerusalem and Judea and to the Jewish people alone, it was, the, it was the sign that it was now moving outward. And it's like this. Jesus is saying to himself, I realize that I've done all I can without sacrifice. John 12, right then, this is, this is how you know that's what he's thinking because the next thing he says is, I tell you the truth. Unless a grain of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new grains, a plentiful harvest of new lives. They say the Gentiles are at the door. This thing is about to go worldwide, and Jesus says, I'm just one guy, healing, teaching, ministering. I've done all I can do that way. Now it's time for me to sacrifice. My hour has come. Because in order to have the ultimate harvest, Jesus realized I'm going to have to make the ultimate sacrifice, and that is exactly what he did. Look at what 2 Corinthians 8 says. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Generosity is our privilege because we follow an example, a Savior, who at great cost altered everything about his own life, about his own existence. For, for your sake, the Bible says, he became poor so that you and I could become rich. You know what? If we're talking about billion-dollar days... Do you know what the ultimate rich, rich, riches are? Eternal life. That's what Jesus died. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, this is why I'm giving myself so that those who, whoever would believe in me would not perish, but would have eternal life. Before we go any further today, and before I ask you to do anything beyond what, you know, before I have a moment and say, hey, we're going to give, we're gonna, I'm not doing it. We're not parading people forward, not passing any buckets. Don't worry about that. Before any of this, this is the most important moment today that we're going to have. And I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads for just one moment. Because I think there might be, there might just be somebody in the room today that for you, this is your moment to, to receive Riches from God. He said, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about eternal life. The Bible says that you and I have been infected by sin and it has separated us from God. But Jesus, the Bible says, became poor, left the riches of heaven and suffered the way that he had lived the life that you and I were supposed to live, died a death that we deserve to die so that you and I could actually have eternal life. We could be reconciled to our heavenly Father so that we could have a relationship with him. And if you don't, if you can't say with with assurance today that you have that, I believe before you leave today, you can get it. If that's you, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you right now, because we're out of time, but I'm going to ask you right now to raise your hand so that I can pray with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? You can put your hands down. Is there anybody else? I'm going to ask everybody in the house just to pray with me this prayer. I want you to say this. Dear Lord Jesus, come on, say it loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with the Father. So today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. You can look at me right now. Let's all stand together and let's, let's praise the Lord for these two today who, who come into eternal life. I believe that. When we trust in that way, 
And so when our lives are entrusted to him, then there's this, then everything else follows. So here's what I'm going to do today. My ask of you today, I said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to take an offering. My offering is knowing that you all got your, you all got your offerings in your pockets, right? You can give in three different ways. You got our app if you have it on your phone already. You can text a dollar amount and you get texted back with some instructions. Or you can go to our website at newcity.life and just give. And I want to challenge you. Some of you are not givers. And I'm saying this step today of just giving something and saying, you know what? I want my life to be oriented around generosity. That's my challenge for you. I'm, nobody's going to check. I, and you can, if you, if you feel really embarrassed and you want to take out your phone and look at Instagram, like you're, you know, I'm actually giving right now, but you're not, you know, that's fine. This is not, nobody's checking on you, right? I'm saying my challenge to you is, is, is to orient your life around this and to give thanks to God and to say this is the seed that I'm sowing. The 10% that belongs to God, whatever more in my heart that I feel to give, whatever that might be, the seed that I'm sowing today, believing for a harvest. God says it like this. He says, test me in this. If you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, right, all that belongs to God, the 10% that is his, he says, test me in it. I will pour out blessing on you. You, will never, you won't have any need. So I want to encourage you with that today. Test God in this and start that journey of giving, all right? Now, what I asked the team to do, I know it's late, but hey, you know, it's late. We, we all came to church today. You drove a long way, so we're making the most of it. We're going to give thanks to God right now because it wouldn't be right for us to go out sad like our text says that God loves a cheerful giver, right? So it wouldn't be right for us to go out sad. So we're going to sing, that, bless the Lord. From the top, here we go. We're going to say, da, 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 da. That's what we're going to do, all right? It's my favorite. Right? Celeste has to do this all the time because I love this song. Put your hands together. Sunday. Here we go.